Nosso painel agora vai falar sobre um tema muito importante, muito desafiador, quando a gente fala sobre a carteira dos nossos clientes. O próximo painel vai ser sobre a alocação global, construção de portfólios resilientes. Lembrando que o painel será em inglês e nós temos tradução simultânea, basta solicitar o fone às nossas promotoras. I would like to welcome Jonathan Hubbard, Director na MFS, Brett Collins, Managing Director e Gestor de Portfólio na Nomura, com moderação de Jojo, sócio do BTG Pactual. Hello, everybody. Uh, I have prepared a, a, a list of a few questions here for for Brett and, and Jonathan, and so it's uh, welcome you all to the Building Resilient Portfolios Global Allocation that except for more than investors. Uh, in today's rapidly changing landscape, economic landscape, it's crucial for investors to develop strategies that can withstand market volatility and global uncertainties. Our distinguished panelists will share their insights on how, how to navigate these challenges and make informed investment decisions, or as one of our colleagues here said, how to make money with zero risk in this environment. Right? <laughs> uh, so let me introduce you to the panelists. Uh, so please welcome Brett Collins. Brett is an executive director and portfolio manager at Nomura Asset Management, where he specializes in fixed income high yield strategies, emerging markets debt, and multi-asset credit. He rejoined Nomura in 2021, having previously worked there from 96 to 2004. He also had held significant roles at State Street Global Advisors, including quantitative equity portfolio manager. So pretty much everything, right? And Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Hubert, he is a managing director within Investment Solutions Group at MFS Investment Management, where he focuses on asset allocation strategy, portfolio structure, and global investment trends. Uh, since joining MFS in 2000, he has held various roles, including relationship manager and director of institutional DCM uh, platforms. So. Uh, we are thrilled to have these two experts with us today, so let's share their thoughts and let's dive into the discussions. Uh, so let's start with, with you, Brett. Uh, how does Nomura perceive the current state and future outlook of the US economy? Does the anticipation of the upcoming elections have an impact on Nomura's economic projection or, or projections or strategy? Great, well, thanks, Jojo, and thanks all of you for joining us. I appreciate you sticking around after lunch and, uh, and, and joining the second half of this session. But, um, you know, from an economic perspective, we're, the, the, my team at, at Nomura is basically expecting more of the same of what we've seen so far this year. You know, GDP growth in the first quarter was up about 1.3%. Um, final demand was a little bit higher than that, closer to three. But, you know, we expect the economy to slow this year but the U.S. would be able to avoid a recession over the next 12 months. Now, we don't think we're totally out of the woods on a recession, though. There's actually pretty good arguments on the case for both continued growth and for potential for a mild recession, right? So on the strong side, employment is showing signs of deteriorating in the U.S., but it's still fairly resilient. Under the unemployment rate in the U.S. is 4%. There's still about 1.25 job openings, for every unemployed worker in the US. Um, we're seeing some signs of consumer deterioration, but mostly on the lower end of the in income spectrum. You know, higher income people or people that aren't in the lowest tier of income earners are continuing to spend. And that's really keeping the economy moving forward. But more broadly than that, there are significant pockets of growth around the US that are driving economic activity. Right. There's still a lot of, of stimulus spending that to needs to be put to work in infrastructure. That's an important area. We're seeing spending on technology or on artificial intelligence. And importantly, the electricity to fuel the data centers behind, art behind artificial intelligence. Important growth areas. In terms of energy, there's not, as much, there's not much activity on the new well drilling side, but there's a lot of investment going into maximizing production out of existing wells. And also, travel and leisure 
is another area where we're seeing significant investment. Hotels and casinos upgrading their facilities, airlines trading in older aircraft, upgrading to more fuel efficient aircraft moving forward. You know, these are all pockets of growth, very important to the US growth story. But on the negative side, we have seen 525 basis points of Fed hikes in less than a year and a half. That's a lot of tightening in a short period of time. And as much as the Fed wants to tighten, Inflation remains stubborn at above the Fed's 2% target, so rates will remain higher for longer. You know, similarly, we've seen money supply growth has declined from its peak in the middle of 2022. So it's rare that we've seen two years of contraction in money supply. It's starting to creep higher slowly, but still money supply is lower than it was two years ago. And then in terms of lending, we're seeing, um, you know, it's it's becoming incrementally more difficult, continuing to become incrementally more difficult for companies to access bank financing. Right, so these are all factors that work with a long and variable lag that we think will slow the economy over the next 12 months and have already started to show signs of slowing the economy, but not enough to, to drag the US into recession. Now, in terms of the election, we think the election will create a lot of volatility. Right? So as of now, Trump is the front runner. Biden is starting to make some progress on the uh, polls of, of um, the just general preference for candidates across the US, but it's not, that doesn't drive the winner of the race. The winner is gonna be who wins more of the 50 state level races, right? So there's eight states that are gonna drive the presidential election. Trump is still uh, faring pretty well in the polls in those eight states. So he's the front runner as of today, but a lot's gonna happen between now and November, including a debate next week um, that could shake things up. So we expect the election to create a lot of volatility, but probably not have a lasting impact on the market. Right? Both, both candidates are favor expansionary fiscal policy. Both candidates are likely to move in a more protectionist trade direction. These are inflationary factors that may impact the Fed's flexibility to ease rates. Um, so you know, at the margin, Trump's favors less regulated, has a lighter regulatory touch, favors lower taxes that would likely help corporate margins over the next few years, but in the near term, probably not so much impact on markets, but a lot of impact on volatility. Thank you. Jonathan, uh, we spoke yesterday about some of these on a private meeting. Uh, so despite the weaker uh, first quarter GDP numbers, what factors have contributed to the economy's re resilience to rate hikes? Is there a change in the effectiveness of US monetary policy, or are there other dynamics at play? What are your expectations for the future actions of the Fed and other central banks around the world? Yeah, thanks for the question, Jojo. So um, we definitely have seen the US economy be much more resilient than expected. It actually re-accelerated in the second half of 23. Everyone was expecting recession second half of 23 or early 24. Um, as Brett mentioned, we didn't see that in the first quarter of uh, this year, although it was a little bit weaker, but now expectations are that we're gonna have uh, closer to a, a, a two and a half or three percent GDP growth for the second half. And, and what's contributed to that? Fiscal is a huge piece of it. In the US, we put five trillion dollars of fiscal stimulus into a 21 trillion dollar economy over a very short period of time. Now, that's unprecedented in number one, in an expansionary period, and number two, uh, in a period where we're not in the middle of a war. So that's the highest level in terms of fiscal expense as a percentage of GDP that's ever been pushed into the economy since World War II. Now, the other element there is monetary policy. Everybody thought that monetary policy and moving rates up so quickly, so abruptly, was going to slow the consumer down. It hasn't. They still have leftover fiscal in their pocket and it's still making its way through state and local channels. So in the US, some fiscal went directly to consumers, but much of it went through state and local channels. And it's actually still taking time for that to dribble out into the economy. So we're still seeing that, I think, uh, give some health to small businesses. And also I would say on the employment side, uh, we've had an extremely tight labor market. And there's several things that have contributed to that, including people with long COVID that were unable to work, uh, the extended benefits that were offered following the COVID uh, fiscal period, uh, which allowed for people to either take part-time work or not take work at all. 
And we've also had uh, massive rises in uh, expenses around child and elder care. So it's very difficult for two, you know, two income family to uh, have to make the decision, do you work or do you pay this extra extraordinary amount of money to have uh, your children or, or, or loved one who's older taken care of? So that's really decreased the amount of workers in several cohorts. Now we've seen an increase in worker participation in the younger cohorts, but in 55 and over, it hasn't recovered from the collapse that occurred during the COVID period. The last thing I would say why the economy has been more resilient is that consumers and businesses, they did the right thing during the low interest rate monetary environment. They termed out and locked in low fixed rates. The only entity that didn't do that was the US government, and they're the ones that should have done that. Well, perfect. Uh, going back to you, Brad, now that we have a, a little bit of a background on the, on the economy, so given the current tightness in high yield spreads, what justifies investments in high yield bonds despite a potentially slowing economy? Are there specific sectors or factors within the high yield market that offer compelling opportunities? Great, yeah, so spreads are relatively tight. Today, the U.S. high yield spreads are at about 325 basis points, which is at the tight end of the range we've seen over the last 10 years. But the reason that we're constructive on high yield is because of the all-in yield that the asset class offers, you know, close to 8% yields in high yield. Right? So that covers the, the, you know, the generous compensation for the credit risk in, in the high yield market. Right? So it's more than just a matter of buying cheap bonds at these levels, though, because the fundamentals remain resilient. Like the U.S. economy, the, the um, or operating earnings that are generated by high yield companies remain resilient. We're, we just got through first quarter earnings season. Operating earnings were just about flat in the first quarter versus the first quarter of last year. So high yield companies continue to generate cash flow at a fairly high level. And that's trickling down into the key metrics in the high yield market, looking at things like leverage and, and interest coverage. Down a little bit from exceptionally high levels last year, but still very strong relative to history. Right? So fundamentals remain robust. And this is a market that's more than 50% double B, which is the high end of the historical range over more than 30 years of data, and only 12% triple C and below, which is at the low end of the range. So definitely a, it's a different market than we've seen historically. But the other factor that's worth mentioning, and, and John just alluded to this, is the technicals, right? The, the high yield companies have locked, in attractive, have, have locked in attractive rates on financing. Um, you know, we've seen the high yield market last year has contract, in the last two years, contracted by about $100 billion in both years. And this is short of a $1.5 trillion market. So that was a lot of contraction in both 22 and 23. This year, we're seeing the market continue to contract in the sense of there's been more upgrades of high yield companies to investment grade than fallen angel downgrades into the investment grade market. But that's only been about $20 billion difference between those two data sets. But what's been more important is the lack of net new issuance in the high yield market. This has been a heavy, heavy year for net, for gross new issuance. There's been about $160 billion of new issuance this year, but less than 30 billion of that issuance was new capital. Rates are too high. Companies are not demanding new debt, right? So the, the issuance we've seen is just is refinancing existing debt. So it's not bringing new bonds into the market. We've seen flows return. We've seen that in the US um, mutual funds and ETS, which is where we can get the best data, but anecdotally we've seen crossover investors tapping into the attractive yields and high yield, right? So yields are attractive, fundamentals are resilient, and technicals are very supportive for high yield. Good. Jonathan, going further w about bonds, uh, what are your thoughts with, with tight spreads in the corporate bond market? What is the current state and outlook for these spreads? How is MFS positioning its core plus strategies in the light of these valuations? Yeah, so to Brett's point, we think that the all-in yields are very attractive across a number of different asset classes, from core bonds to uh, investment grade, high yield, and emerging market debt as well. And a, a lot of the empirical data suggests that you can maintain tight spreads for quite a long time. Um, so just because spreads are tight, there needs to be a catalyst for them to move out. And right now, considering the all-in yields where we are, there's more than enough to absorb any uh, credit uh, uh, spread expansion out there. So uh, we don't expect you to get a lot of pickup from uh, 
credit, credit spread contraction, but we do expect spreads to remain stable and for that strong technical bid to continue. Now, we listen to uh, our traders every day at nine o'clock and they talk about the technical bid and every deal that comes to market in the investment grade and many in the high yield get taken down very, very quickly. So there's an insatiable demand for this type of debt out there um, because investors can finally get very good carry and they don't have to go too far out on the risk spectrum to get that carry any longer. And it's also of our view that the Federal Reserve is going to, at some point, uh, have to engage in bringing down the federal funds rate. Uh, the, our expectation is that it'll be likely later in this year. Uh, they've demonstrated that they're gonna be very data dependent, um, which unfortunately uh, is always a backward looking exercise. Um, but we think that it's unlikely that they cut in July. We think that it's unlikely that they cut in November because of the optics so close to the election, the day after the election. So the best bet is probably December if they cut. Cut by 25 basis points, 50 basis points. That's gonna be accretive to any return that you get in fixed income. And then through 2025, expectations are for further cuts. So if you get some modest cuts and you get that carry on the front end, uh, we think it's an extremely attractive environment for fixed income. So Brett, within this environment, in comparison to other credit markets, like investment grade, emerging markets, uh, what are advantages or disadvantages does high yield offer a country? Uh, what metrics or indicators are most relevant when evaluating these, alter these opportunities? Yeah, so we think the most, you know, the, when we're assessing the attractiveness of the high yield market, you know, we tend to look at yield, price, and spread, right? So, we, you know, spreads are tight, right? They're, doesn't look highly compelling on a spread basis, but again, on a yield basis, very compelling. And also on a dollar price basis, the average dollar price in the high yield market is about 93, right? So the bonds trading at a discount tend to have better convexity. There's a lot of room to run if we can identify improving credits. Now, when we're looking at how high yield stacks up versus other public fixed income asset classes, you know, high yield is the highest yielding of the public fixed income asset classes with the shortest duration, right? So if rates, move side, if, if the yield and high yield move sideways, which we think is the most likely scenario, then investors will benefit from holding high yield because of that very attractive carry, right? If, if we see, you know, inflation data come in on the surprising side, we see another turn, upturn in interest rates, then high yield will benefit from its shorter duration. Right? If, if the discussion in the U.S. moves from, is this, will this be a soft landing or a mild recession to, will there be no landing at all? you know, a higher, much stronger than expected economic growth, you know, that's an environment that, that, um, that positions high yield quite well to deliver attractive returns. Now, the environment where high yield would underperform, the environment where you don't want to be overweight high yield, is that harder than expected recession, right? An environment where spreads widen out substantially and, and you know, inflation comes down quickly, the Fed starts to ease aggressively, bringing rates down across the curve, right? That would be a negative scenario for high yield, but we think it's unlikely. And for the reasons that, that John mentioned and I mentioned as well, just that there's too much underlying strength in the U.S. If there is a recession, it's likely to be a mild recession, not a hard landing recession. And that kind of environment would see, you know, modest increase in, in high yield spreads, but would also likely see treasury rates come down. So again, in that environment, we would expect high yield yields to generally move sideways. You know, the mix of spread versus treasury rates would change, but rates would stay in that 8% neighborhood. Again, le allowing investors to capture that very attractive carry and deliver a solid total return. And, okay. I'm, I'm thinking about what, how I'm gonna tie this to the, your next question, but let me move to, to Jonathan here. Uh, in this current uh, economic environment, how should investors balance their portfolios between stock and bonds? Or are there any other asset classes that they should be considering in the current environment? Yeah, so right now, um, our recommendation is to be relative to your strategic long-term allocation to be overweight fixed income relative to equities. Now, we don't think that there's um, a, a massive amount of risk in equities, although there's risk in pockets of U.S. equities for sure. Um, however, from an adjusted risk return standpoint, much more compelling to be invested in fixed income relative to equities right now. Now, one way, a, a sort of uh, a, a quick heuristic to, to determine the stock bond mix is to look at uh, equity risk premium as measured by the gap between the 10-year treasury yield 
in the earnings yield of the S&P 500. And right now, that's negative. And historically, for longer term investment horizons, for 10 year investment horizons or more, uh, the, the smaller that that equity risk premium is, uh, the more likely you are to have fixed income outperform equities right now. So if you think about the period from 2010 through 2020, we had quite the high equity risk premium as measured by that metric. And we know that we had one of the best performing equity markets uh, globally uh, in history. So we, we do think that you want to um, you want to be biased towards fixed income and depending on your risk profile, you can create a very attractively yielding portfolio of six, seven, eight percent with the variety of fixed income instruments that are out there. In addition, today you have a much greater variety. So beyond the publicly traded uh, bonds out there, you do have private debt that has certainly uh, made its way onto the forefront of many investors' minds. So, you know, we think this is just a great opportunity to get most of the return of the equity market with about a third of the risk. Good. Uh, so, Brad, you, you and Jonathan have been constructing this, this view of the attractiveness of the fixed income in the U.S., but here our crowd is primarily base of Brazilian investors and we are considering the, the high yields offered by our local fixed income investments. Uh, how, what are the reasons for us Brazilian investors to consider diversifying into hard currency, emerging market debt or US debt and what risks and opportunities do you think that Brazilian investors should be aware before making this shift? Sure and you know it's, it's a really good question and the, the vast majority of investor meetings that I have, the local government bond market yields less than 8%. So if I'm talking to a US investor or a Europe-based investor or a Japanese investor, they get pretty excited about 8%. When I'm talking to a market with local government bond rates and double digits, it's, it's less exciting, right? But really the, the answer of why it makes sense is, is for portfolio diversification, right? So if you think, I mean, there's, there's, um, there's a lot of good reasons why you should have your, a significant home bias in your portfolio. I mean, yield's clearly very attractive. Um, you know, the, your liabilities are, are based on the local currency, right? So you want your asset portfolio to align with, with your liabilities. So that makes a lot of sense. But you know, having too much country risk, having too much home country risk, um, is, it's similar to when you're thinking about your own retirement portfolio. You know, you probably don't want to load up your retirement portfolio w with the stock of the company that you work for. All right, you're an insider, you understand your company really well, you might really believe in the mission and your ability of your company to out-compete other firms that are operating in the same space. But if you're wrong, if things go poorly, then you may find yourself out of a job and a big hole in your retirement portfolio. So I think you need to think about those kinds of things when you're considering your portfolio. And, you know, if we were having this conversation in January, January 1st, we'd be looking at, okay, you can go out and buy a one-year Brazil bond at, at around 1%, at around 10% yield, or you can buy a one-year treasury at around 5% yield. I mean, clearly, you'd rather have the, the higher yield and higher prospective return from your local currency market. But, you know, that we didn't anticipate that inflation would remain so stubborn in the U.S., and the Fed would, would have to be forced to hold rates higher for longer at the same time Brazil was reducing rates in the local market, right? So the currency is down, the dollar is up 10% against the, the real. So the, you know, in, in dollar terms, as of today, you'd be better off holding that one year if you had made the investment in the U.S. Treasury market versus if you made the investment in your own local market, right? So these, um, you know, there's, there's the diversification benefits because the beauty of diversification is you never know when it's going to pay off, but eventually it will. Um, and then, you know, when you think about the, the, the political risks in Brazil, right, the, the U.S. election is going to shake things up globally, right? And again, Trump is the front runner. A lot can change between now and November, but Trump's the front runner. And it's unlikely that Lula and Trump are going to see eye to eye on many political issues. And whoever wins in the U.S., whether it's Trump or Biden, the direction of trade policy is likely headed in a more protectionist way, right? So that impacts a Brazil's ability to export to the U.S., but that, you know, you could see, potentially see kind of one upsmanship 
on trade protectionism that re reduces uh, investment opportunities for all countries, right? So, um, and, and it creates a much more protectionist environment um, across the globe, right? So, so that idea of, of diversifying into, um, you know, other, other asset classes, diversifying into other revenue streams um, makes a lot of sense. And investing in, in the emerging market, hard currency market, offers tremendous portfolio diversification. Right? Just looking at emerging market corporates, there's a, more than 60 countries represented in the emerging corporate market, corporate bond market. And you know, these are countries that have very different economic drivers. You have commodity exporters, you have manufacturing companies, you have more service-oriented economies, companies that are more export-focused, countries that are more, um, generate more return from the local, local consumption. Right, so there's a lot of diversification. There's diversification across geographies. Um, there's you know Latin American investments. You know many of the companies that you all know as, as Latin American investments, Latin American residents. Uh, there's you know exposure to Europe, Middle East, Africa, the Far East. There's also a lot of diversification across credit quality. Sixty percent of the emerging market corporate bond market is investment grade, and you know that the the market offers pretty attractive returns for this you know, largely investment grade profile, yields that are similar to high yield with an average investment grade rating. And you know, digging down this one, one level down below the surface, when investing in emerging markets corporates involves taking both corporate risk but also taking country risk. So the compensation per unit of risk tends to be higher in emerging markets versus investing in developed market corporate bonds. Right, so if you measure the prospective returns or the compensation on offer um, across the credit spectrum, whether you're looking at investment grade, crossover, or high yield bond markets, the spread per turn of leverage in emerging markets is significantly more generous than can be earned in developed markets. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan, uh, you mentioned your preference or slight preference for fixed income over stocks, but I have a, a, a question on stocks, given the, the strength of the US uh, stock market, despite the fact that it's more towards the tech industry. So historically, higher rates and inflation have favored US value and international over uh, US growth. Does this trend still hold in this environment? And what are your views on the performance of small caps compared to this tech frenzy? Yeah, that's a lot of questions on equities, but I'll try to take them each down here. So, um, you know, w w within, within the value growth split, we've clearly seen this massive growth of, uh, of, of a small handful of growth stocks leading the markets over value. Um, but the funny thing is that through the end of 2023, in US dollar terms, the trailing three-year performance of growth versus value was exactly the same. And that's because during the 2022 drawdown, um, you had some of these large cap technology stocks that lost 40, 50, or 60% of their value. So that's proof of why you want to have value in your portfolio. Um, but also uh, evidence that, um, that higher interest rates this time around are not necessarily impeding growth companies. Because again, these balance sheets of growth companies are much stronger than they have been historically, and they've termed out that debt. Um, some of these companies are borrowing in the IG market with just a handful of basis points um, uh, in, in terms of a spread. So, uh, you know, we, we do think you want to have that diversified portfolio, and we do think there's actually some really attractive opportunities in the value space. And as you think about the value space, extending that to international outside the U.S. borders because the compositional structure of international markets is such that it's more oriented towards value. Uh, and, you know, industrial goods and services, uh, consumer staples, uh, we think are, are, are two sectors where there's some really good opportunity out there to get in from a, a much uh, more reasonable valuation, um, but will also benefit from having fixed cost versus variable cost. So in a higher inflationary environment, a lot of these growth companies that have high variable costs get weighed down by that inflationary aspect. Okay. Uh, so back to you, Jonathan, uh, and back to our, to Brad, sorry. And with the, still with our focus on, on the local 
investors and, uh, and picking up a little bit on the stock on the equity market here. Uh, are there, what are the benefits for Latam investors to diversify uh, into international credit markets rather than solely focusing on equities? And how can credit investments complement these equity holdings in this uh, balanced portfolio? Great. I, I think that's one of the significant and interesting developments we've seen in the high yield market over the last decade is more and more investors globally in emerging markets and in developed markets adding high yield to their strategic asset allocation. And there's, you know, initially it was the, the yield is attractive in a low yield environment, you know, prior to um, 2022 in a very low yield environment, high yield was one of the few sources of yield in the portfolio. So more and more investors included high yield in their strategic allocation. But, you know, more broadly than yield, high yield offers very attractive risk adjusted returns versus other asset classes. It offers correlation, or, you know, a diversification, low correlation, almost zero correlation to equities or to, to rates and a relatively low correlation to equities. Um, and it's a less efficient market where it's an interesting place to spend your risk budget as an investor, your active risk budget as an investor. So, you know, in terms of the risk adjusted returns of equities, if you compare of, of high yield versus rates, the total return of high yield over the last 30 years and, and high yield has been much higher than rates. And you're looking forward, you know, most, um, you know, capital markets forecasts are going to ascribe much higher expected return for high yield versus rates because of the, the increased risk. Now, comparing high yield to equities, you know, equities have a higher expected return. They have a higher realized return over the last three decades. Um, but that return comes at a cost of much more downside, larger drawdowns, more volatility, right? So on a risk adjusted basis, the high yield, high yield return looks attractive relative to rates, and it also looks attractive versus equities. So the asset class has really earned a place in investors' strategic allocations. Now, again, in terms of correlation, the correlation to rates is almost zero over, over the last 20 years, you know, over the last 30 years, which was actually surprising to me when I looked at the data. Um, but the, the, so high yield is an excellent diversifier for a fixed income portfolio. But even in a multi-asset class portfolio, it brings something different because of that. It's the properties of, of a risk asset, but also the property of a fixed income asset. Right? So it, the correlation adds something to the portfolio. It adds to your portfolio level expected returns. And then when you think about high yield as, a, as an active versus passive asset class, there's a lot of bonds in the high yield market that get put away. It comes in the new issue market, Insurance companies take it down, hold the bond to maturity, it never trades again. It's a really difficult market to track closely as a passive investor. And at the same time, it's a less efficient asset class. There's a lot of private issuers in the market that aren't covered by Wall Street analysts. There's a lot of smaller cap, micro cap type names in the market that don't have solid analyst coverage. So there's an opportunity for skilled asset managers to add alpha versus the benchmark. So over time, when you look at the hit rate of active managers in high yield versus their benchmark or versus passive alternatives, there's a much higher hit rate of positive performance in high yield than there are in other asset classes, whether that's rates or equities. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting place to spend your risk budget if you're deciding where should I buy beta, where should I seek some alpha, high yield is a very attractive place to look for alpha, right? So, you know, high, high risk adjusted returns, you know, um, bring some diversification in terms of correlation in your broader portfolios, and it's an excellent place to spend your risk budget. So when we look at the flows we've seen, we've actually seen pretty aggressive, and my team has seen pretty aggressive inflows over the last two years. And interestingly, they've come from both directions. It's come from cash sitting on the sidelines where investors have been putting, looking to put money to work, add some duration, add some risk to the portfolio, and upping their risk by buying high yield. But now we're starting to see it come from equities where there's concerns about equity valuation, there's concerns about potential downside. So that nice 8% carry gives you some cushion in a risk off environment where risk assets underperform. So we're starting to see flows coming into high yield from equity investments. Very good, thank you. Interesting points. Uh, Jonathan, yesterday in our meeting, you mentioned the, 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 the term uh, 
it's not that the world is going backwards in globalization, but it's re-globalization. Or so, how how does this this trend uh, leading to the resurgence of global supply chains? Uh, how this shifts this uh, the way to look at, at the the economy and and asset classes and what does that mean for, for equities and, and fixed income? Yeah, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, and as you know, I'm pretty passionate about this. I think that this is going to be one of the largest macro drivers over the next 10 years. And the term that I use instead of deglobalization is reglobalization. So we've had a confluence of events that have occurred over the past five or six years, uh, including the Trump tariffs, many of which are still in place, uh, COVID blocking off supply chain access to companies, the Russia invasion of Ukraine, the war in the Middle East, uh, including some of the challenges around uh, the Red Sea and, and, and uh, the, the inability for many ships to get through there. So we're starting to see a change in global trade flows and global trade relationships. China now is losing uh, a lot of the U.S. imports that they were sending to the U.S., um, and it's a significant number right now. So uh, where are those imports coming from? Uh, they're coming from places like Indonesia. They're coming from Brazil. They're coming from Vietnam. So there's a complete retooling to global trade relationships that is occurring. And uh, as Brett mentioned, there's some real similarities between President Biden and President Trump. Uh, one of them is that they are both interested in these protectionist policies um, where they are more than happy to conduct industrial policy, meaning that they're going to focus government assets and government resources to select industries that they see as either critical to the U.S., uh, for example, uh, semiconductor manufacturing, which is important not only for cars, not only for computers, not only for phones, but also critical uh, for missile defense systems, for example. Other places, pharmaceutical manufacture, medical devices, you're going to see a lot of that come back to the U.S. or a lot of that come back to our partners. And I think that that's going to occur at a rate that is much quicker than folks anticipate. Now, what does that mean? That means great opportunity for many emerging market countries. It means very good opportunity for uh, Mexico and Canada, which are the top two trading partners with the U.S. Um, but this reglobalization is going to take shape in a way that's hard to totally anticipate now, but it is going to have an impact, and I think it's going to be uh, a, a tremendous opportunity for com countries that are uh, in a position to be able to accelerate their economic growth and support this type of activity. One country I would point to is India. And India has had a 7% GDP growth for the past two years in a row. Its share of the emerging market index has doubled. Market cap has doubled uh, within that index over the past three years only. And they're making significant infrastructure investments, which are really needed in India, um, in order to support some of the uh, manufacturing and some of the goods creation that was done in China that will now be done in India, Indonesia, Brazil, and other countries around the world. So we'll see if I'm right in 10 years, but I think that this is going to be a massive macro driver. Uh, I think building on this question, I think it, this would be b for both of you. Uh, the, the geopolitical risks that we are facing, uh, you, you, you give a, some good examples on how this impacts the, 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 the economy, but do you think that there is a, a risk of the world like splitting into like I, I would invest in these co countries because they are paired with the U.S. I want to invest in these countries because they are paired with China and Russia, or and especially Brazil. Can you can place Brazil in a position of a neutral company, a neutral country that could be f talking to both sides? But on the political side, it looks like we we shift. Do do you do you think about this on a daily basis, or you're more pragmatic? And, and look into micro uh, details. I mean, it, it's a it's a very it's an excellent question, right? And um, I think we're gonna over we the ha years. We have six minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're, there's it's hard to, to say um, you know to be prescient and say what's going to happen over the over in the coming years, but you know it's it's more common than it's not. 
to have the world in, in to separate it into separate blocks than it is to have you know one uh, peaceful world that's focused on on commercial connections, right? So um, I wouldn't be surprised to see us head in that direction, um, but you know there, a, a lot remains to be seen. Um, and you know the I think trade you know trading partners tend to not invade each other. Right, so um, you know, if we head in this more protectionist direction of um, you know higher trade barriers, higher tariffs, um, you know, more, you know, in, I think a lot of what we see around you know some of the green agenda is really protectionism that's cloaked in, in environmentalism, right? So um, you know, these are the kinds of things that can can force the world to split apart and um, you know, create a much less peaceful place. And that's, you know, I didn't answer your question earlier around you know, some of the areas where we've been investing, but um, you know, one of them is aerospace and defense, right? Which is just, the world's becoming a much more dangerous place. So um, countries, every country's gonna make sure that they're, that they're protecting themselves. The US is withdrawing from its global leadership role. So I think more and more countries are gonna have to, to, to defend themselves versus depend on the US to defend them. And that requires more spending on, on aerospace and defense. It requires more spending on oil, gas supplies, commodity supplies, right? So, um, you know, I think the, there's gonna be a, kind of another focus on, on countries building alliances to make sure they can get access to the raw materials they need. They're partnering with reliable companies on manufacturing capabilities that they don't have and doing a lot more in-house. I would just add real quickly that um, I think the sides are already being chosen. Uh, most certainly with China, Russia, and Iran, that alliance is starting to form, and that's something that we need to address very quickly. Unfortunately, in the United States this year, we're going to spend more on servicing our national debt than we will on defense spending. Okay, that's a problem. That's the first time it's ever happened uh, in history post World War II. So, the money right now that the U.S. government is spending on entitlements, on giveaways is massive and it needs to be corrected. The, um, the, the Office of Budget Management just released on Tuesday their report and they're anticipating a 7% deficit for the next several years. They project 10 years out, but I think it's hard to project past two or three. Um, but that's a, a, a level that is just unnecessary. So we need to cut some of these entitlement programs in the U.S. and uh, we need to make sure that we do it quickly in order to build up that defense spending. Does, uh, does your answer, both of you, uh, somehow relate to the higher, to the prices of gold that we see? Or, or, no, or what are your thoughts on gold? I know you like it, <laughs> Pri privately. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll go for I, I mean, I like But do you think that that relates to this because of the high interest rates wouldn't? Yeah. yeah, so we've seen a breakdown in the relationship to real interest rates and gold because I think other factors are starting to drive gold prices. Um, gold is the one asset class where there is uh, no liability. You have no real counterparty if you have the physical gold. You certainly do if you have ETFs or things of that nature. Um, but gold has been, and I think will continue to be, a good diversifier, even if for different reasons than it might have been historically. Um, and I think some of the, 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 the rise in gold prices you've seen recently can be tied back to central banks wanting to have additional gold reserves. Uh, some central banks don't want to have dollar reserves anymore. I know Russia doesn't. I know China doesn't necessarily. Um, so what do you hold as a reserve asset that you can lend from? Gold seems like a pretty reasonable um, asset class to look at, and we know that over long periods of time, it can be a really excellent diversifier. Yeah, uh, um, a, a, an analyst that I, I have a lot of respect for um, once told me that gold is not a hedge against inflation, it's a hedge against chaos. And we're seeing that with, you know, like with some, something like more than two-thirds of, of the world population is having elections this year, right? So we've seen surprises in 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 European elections last week, in India, in Mexico, right? So there's just a lot of surprising developments. You know, there's a lot of uninspiring leaders around the world right now. Um, you know, I've been actually highly inspired by Javier Malay to read more about Austrian economics, and they are huge fans of the gold standard. And, and you know, Ron Paul with his End the Fed book, and uh, Maury Rothbard and his work of moving away from, from Federal Reserve Banking, a fraction of Reserve Banking, towards a gold standard. 
I think we may, you know, the more chaos we have and the less confidence people have in leadership, then we're going to start to see interesting new ideas. Like, I don't personally agree with Trump's suggestion that the U.S. should fund itself with tariffs versus, versus income tax, but what we're doing doesn't work, right? If we're, as, you know, running 7% deficit when there's 4% unemployment, like, nobody has any new idea, nobody has any, the, the, the proven ideas or the, the, the sort of well-accepted ideas aren't working, so it's time to start looking at new ideas. Well, we are closing our panel here perfectly on time. I would like to thank you both for, for having our sharing of thoughts with us, and, and thank you very much for, for the audience. Thank you. Thank you.